they basically become a troll. Mm. A company with patents, or at least a division with patents, and no actual substantial uh, product. So, so, so this is this is really troubling. I'm, I'm trying. Oh, obviously, I'm pretty calm about it. I, people seem to think I'm very. I, I think I was a bit more angry about it, like five, four or five years ago, when these things were starting to happen. So the deal with Samsung in 2007, for example, was one of the first cases of them actually trying to make money from Linux devices or at least something that relates to Linux devices. It's way back in 2007. Uh, but now with phones, I mean, I mean, here you have something that's got a huge penetration into the market, and this is something that scales upwards, not like devices, into something like tablets, uh, and then perhaps the laptops. And this is essentially kind of like, it's not exactly Linux on a desktop, but it's a, in the case of, of Samsung, this probably will cover this later, when they make the deal, or you know, being paid for Android, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's just you know, uh, file allocation tables or Active Sync or any of these things. But uh, maybe it's nothing to do with Linux itself. But when they go up to tablets and they start to extract revenue out of the tablets, that tells you they're also going up to the desktop for tax. You know, as they did with Novell and Zendros and Linspire and Turbo Linux. Um, so they basically don't want any bit of Linux to be free. They go after e-readers, they go after uh, uh, phones, and they very much broadcast this message. Like, you can try and use Linux, but if you do, well, you got to and you know, we, we're going to tell you a list of patents that we've never published, and we will demand some price that's supposed to stay secret. So they have these NDAs. Uh, it's just extortion, really. It's just a uh, use of retaliation or threat of perception of retaliation against the adoption of a product. And then if people don't choose Linux, they'll say, well, people were not interested in it, so... Well, I, I think it's a, an admission of defeat as well, and I think that's something that people should consider, and whilst it may be very frustrating when Microsoft is, is acting in this way, but uh, I think it's an admission of defeat that Microsoft has now conceded to the competition who are producing products that people actually want to buy, and it's not something that's being forced onto, onto anybody. So, with Microsoft still in mind, we'll go over to our next topic, which... Uh, I'm hoping that you're going to lead on this, uh, Roy, because you presented well, for the Symb show. I think Symbian is pretty much dead. I think the layoffs and I, I think the Nokia, the Nokia layoffs are very important because you have to remember most of the phones are being made in Asia. So then you have Nokia, mostly in Europe, uh, mostly. So because they have people all over the place now, and it used to be in Germany and Romania and places like that. Uh, and then you have Apple and Microsoft in the States now. When you see all those major layoffs, like I, think it's, I think it was something like 3,000 layoffs uh, last week or about a week ago. Uh, in Nokia, I mean, these, these are loads of people who used to be able to produce a good operating system in places that are very good at software, not so, not probably not as good at you know, making hardware, because it's expensive to make hardware and they don't have the right metals to do that. Uh, so here in Europe, the development of Symbian is completely kind of trashed as far as I can tell. Uh, this used to be what, what Nokia would use for a very simple phones, and Linux was supposed to be the high-end phones operating system. And now the funny thing is Nokia says that Windows is for the, you know, the smartphones or the sophisticated phones, and then they use Linux for something simpler. Now you have to ask why don't they use Android for you know, better phones? Well, they could do. Uh, I think they were close to. But I think they the were kind of outmaneuvered when, when Microsoft stepped in and took over parts of Nokia. Well, apparently paid some amount of cash, maybe a couple of billions or something, to basically neutralize uh, the company to bring it to its knees and to try and hurt Migo at the same time. And this actually leads me, have you heard of Tizen? No. So the Linux Foundation and Intel were left with the situation where they still have the trademark of Migo um, from before and when Nokia basically gave its uh, what what used to be called Mimo uh, and, and, and Intel basically broke Mobilein, which was also a Linux based operating system which was less to do with phones and more to do with like netbooks and things. Uh, and they combined it to make Migo. Now Nokia isn't quite so interested in continuing uh, to develop to actively market or something Migo for obvious reasons. So I'm not sure why, but Intel and the Linux Foundation with the trademarks and with the code, they just created a new name 
a new brand. Uh, basically, you can look at Intel moving from Mobile to then to uh, Migo, and now moving away from something called Tizen, which I think just sounds like Tarzan, uh, which is quite unfortunate. And apparently that's going to be for, I imagine, for vehicles and things as well, because that's one of the things that Intel was trying to do with those with its own Linux platform. Um, so, so that's that's like a new Linux operating system or a new distro of sorts, um, which which just shows you that even once a company decides to not work in a bit of code anymore, you can still take the source code and make anything you want out of it. And any of the participants in the code, people who are relying on you maintaining the code, can still do it themselves, which is probably good news. But well. We'll go on to our next topic, which is a little bit lighter and uh, probably a little bit humorous as well. And it's Chrome being flagged as a virus by Microsoft. And Roy, I'm going to leave the pleasure to you to describe what's been going on here. Right. So, so quite a few things have been going on with Google and Microsoft and all those dirty tricks to do with antitrust. Uh, I suppose we could. Uh, I suppose we covered them previously, didn't we? Or we spoke about I, the fact that the I don't believe so. We what, are you talking about the, the Chrome topic? Because I don't think... Uh, no, well, we it, it just comes at a very interesting time because I think the government starts to think about uh, taking some actions against uh, against Google. And actually, they've been doing it for quite a while. And it's interesting because the ones that should be going after uh, are those who are extorting, using patents and threatening and trying to uh, uh, use illegal... Um, tactics, illegal disclosures, and bribing of people. Uh, the victims of these tactics, are, is one of them would usually be Google. And they're actually going to investigate in Google, which is mostly, as far as I can tell, the victim in the case. I mean, the competition, the, the basis for the competition allegations against Google is that it's basically being anti-competitive against Microsoft, against, let's say, Windows and against uh, the search engines of Microsoft, which basically is the same thing, just under different names all the time, so they can rename it all the time. Uh, and if you look very closely at who's doing what exactly to impede the competition, uh, it's not really Google that's trying to prevent the competition. I don't think Google really forces people to use its products. I don't think that's the company that's trying to derail, uh, to smear the competition, for all I can tell. Uh, and now, um, you know, in, amidst all the talks about, like, you know, Google being you know, competitive and dangerous, and, and I, I think loads of it is basically a PR campaign, and we know that Microsoft funds part of this PR campaign against Google, uh, then you have Microsoft flagging uh, Chrome as a virus. Uh, and now they have all these explanations, and uh, there's a new update from uh, Google that's just, just trying to appear, not as though it's a virus. Uh, there wasn't a reason to do that, and you have to ask yourself, though, would it have happened if, if it was Internet Explorer, would it still happen? And maybe it's a case of negligence and they can pretend to be all very uh, naive about it and, you know, uh, very sorry about it. As, as they were before, when I think in the previous, actually two episodes ago, we, we spoke about the boot sequence and how they can try and use the uh, uh, a new booting system to exclude Linux or to at least prevent the booting of any operating system other than Windows. Now, Microsoft historically likes to use this as a very uh, valid sounding excuse to uh, exclude the competitors to say, oh, it's a nice feature or, oh, you know, it's it's, it's the fault of the GPL v3 that you couldn't uh, possibly implement the, uh, uh, the, the proprietary, in this case, the TVization essentially of the of, 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 of the uh, uh, the, the inclusion of, of support tvization in Linux, for example. So, so in here too, they they you can never actually prove to the court that Microsoft has maliciously done that, plugging like Chrome as a virus, and perhaps those are people deleting the software because they thought it was a virus, and maybe going back to Explorer. You couldn't prove that they didn't do it by uh, choice or deliberate neglect or something like that. But this is not the first time they do all kinds of stuff like that. They used to do that. I, I think the they, I think the ones they did to Firefox at the plugins level. But this is just uh, one more example, I suppose, of the uh, of the uh, either the neglect or the actually the use of their uh, authority as a security vendor 
something which people warned about before, uh, shows you what happens when you give them all this power. They can use it in all sorts of ways, even maliciously. Well, I, I tend to consider this more as another example.